Welcome back. Short break, good break. Uh, see a Sheffield United shirt right in front of me. <laughs> what a welcome back. Okay, uh, so this, uh, that's Lee. This is going to be Molly is the chair for this group. So hello, Molly. Molly's done a fabulous amount for about this conference in the background and helps it keep going. And straight over to you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did. Um, so I'm Molly, obviously. Um, I did write an introduction to this um, where I introduced you to me as well as to the uh, speaker. But I think um, more importantly, I want to say to Peter and Alex, thank you for this conference. I know how hard it's been um, and how much work, um, like actual work and also emotional work has gone into putting this together. And, and I can tell from your emails that you're up at all times of the night trying to make it work but it's been totally worth it. It's been so brilliant um, and really empowering for everybody, I think. So thank you so much. And I hope that this continues afterwards. Um, I also wanted just to quickly reflect on that, even though we must all be intellectually and emotionally exhausted from today, um, that I'm also kind of sad that this is the last panel discussion because uh, I feel like I'm going to get really bad separation anxiety when this is over because this has been the first really affirming and safe space for working class academics that I've seen and I think that's a shared feeling across everybody. I, I hope that this panel empowers everybody to carry on, keep this momentum going. Um, and so yeah, like I was saying, I think this is a really good theme to end on because even though the speakers continue to illuminate on the inequalities experienced by working class academics and students, the presenters really continue to turn the deficit narrative on its head. Um, so rather than looking what is wrong with the individual, they're looking at what is wrong with the structures and what it is about our backgrounds that can be used to our advantage, no matter how much, um, you know, normal academia tries to suppress our power. Um, so I really hope that you find the, this, impact, this an empowering panel um, and I hope that these discussions equip you with the understanding that working class academics and students are not problems, but we are powerful, we are dangerous, and I mean that in the very best way. Um, so moving ahead to our first speaker, so this is Jackie Gabriel. Jackie is an assistant professor of sociology at Western Colorado University. She is a first generation working class college and college graduate and scholar, and her recent work examines working class culture and social class in higher education. I know, Jackie, you're seven hours behind us, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining us, even though it's really early. Um, and I think we're all really looking forward to hearing your presentation, which is titled Skipping Class, Systematically Neglecting the Working Class in Higher Education. Thank you, Molly. Um, also, thank you, Peter and Alex, for all you've been doing and helping um, this unfold the way it has been. Unfortunately, I haven't watched all of the sessions because when they start, it's 2 a.m. my time. Um, so I, I'm thankful that they're being recorded and we can access them later. So with that being said, in my own PowerPoint, there are a few slides that I probably won't share or discuss in this 15 minute um, time span but will be available for you to read at length that, you know, in detail later. I'll just try to go over them um, briefly. So it seem, if it seems like I'm skipping a couple slides, that's why so that it, people that want to look at it later can have that um, information, but I probably won't address them all. Okay, if that makes sense. Um, so, and, and Molly, you'll keep me to my 15 minutes, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can all see it. Um, so skipping class, uh, basically I wanna talk about how uh, American universities in particular and my institution um, neglect, systematically neglect working class students, but also um, faculty. Um, and then maybe give some, say, some kind of a suggestions of, of what we can do differently. Um, as Bell Hooks reminds us that nowhere is there more intense silence about the reality of class difference in educational settings? Um, so I think first and foremost, we need to, we need to recognize um, social class and how it exists in many forms from our students to our faculty, to our staff um, in, in higher education. So when I asked my colleagues about the social class composition of their classrooms, they, 
they tend to be clueless, right? They, they look at me kind of strangely, like, what, what am I talking about social class? Um, and when I similarly ask about the faculty in their depart in departments across my campus and other campuses um, about working class faculty, I, I get you know similar kinds of confused looks. So basically, um, because we don't see class different, you know, we don't necessarily wear it on our sleeves. I think yeah, we see it. Um, we see it in in the way we dress. We see it. We hear it in the way we talk. But um, it's neglected, um, and, and to some extent, I think purposely neglected um, in higher education. So I think that first and foremost, we need to, to um, be upfront about the social class composition of both our students and our faculty. Um, and this is kind of a rhetorical question. Do your colleagues identify as working class? I ask my, you know, across my campus and across US about about colleagues identify working class. And there's a number of reasons why uh, faculty wouldn't, uh, wouldn't identify as working class because we'll be judged differently, right? We'll, we'll uh, be evaluated differently in our student evaluations. Um, we'll be questioned because of our lack of, of, of class knowledge, right? So there are reasons that we may be closeted and there's a great literature on on this in the United States at least on um, why working class faculty remain closeted but I would argue that it's important that us for us to identify as working class um, and particularly for our students when I look at our university and universities across the United States so if I look at my campus profile there's a, a link there and then also if I look at Nash, the National Center for Educational Statistics across the United States that when we look at diversity um, and the composition of our student body. We track um, race and ethnicity, we track uh, a, a gender, um, but we, we <laughs> neglect this other, this other variable, which obviously um, needs to be considered in our conversation and the discourse about, about diversity and inclusion, and that is social class, right? So when the data is compiled, um, our university, when it shows uh, diversity on campus, we have charts and graphs and, and data for race and ethnicity, even increasingly first-generation college students, which is a proxy to some extent for social class, but it doesn't match it um, perfectly, right? Um, so there are a few arguments why um, institutions don't compile this data. And, um, and here are some of the arguments, I'm just gonna be brief about this, that in the United States, social class is such a taboo subject, right? We all assume that we're classless um, and the higher education does a good job of not just of, of just ignoring this or downplaying social class differences. Even in sociology, um, I found that in social inequalities classes and in, in intro sociology, introductory sociology, you know, a, a top a subject that should be looking at class structure that that we tend to uh, to assume that we're a classless society and class is like caste in India and, and we don't we're not affected by it. Um, so the, the fact that it's taboo means that it, we neglect it. Um, there's also a lack of consensus of how to define or conceptualize social class, and then also how to measure it. But I don't think that, I think that that's an excuse. We can use um, proxy measures to get a social class, like uh, Pell Grant eligibility, but we can also just ask students to identify as our social class. So there's ways to measure this, even though imperfect, it's better to have some data or a proxy measure of social class than just to neglect it altogether. Um, but the last argument, and I think that this is perhaps maybe the best argument, is that um, it's not in the institution's best interest to measure uh, social class or to track, um, social track and compile this data because um, it affects our, our ranking as an institution. Right, so for colleges that want to climb up in the ranking system, that there's dis disincentives to recognize social class um, because our working class students tend to take longer to graduate, tend to have lower exam scores, SAT and ATC scores, and they're less likely to graduate within four years. So th there's a number uh, of measures that would suggest that these students um, pose problems for institutions that want to be higher, find themselves higher in the ranking system. So uh, you think that, that my university and a number of universities that have statements on diversity and inclusion, um, they, they really uh, are failing to, to live up to 
those statements, um, given that uh, they, they, may, they give lift service basically to diversity and inclusion. Um, they have statements, but when we look at their, uh, their just lack of, of um, looking at this data, recognizing the class difference, um, it would suggest that you know, these, these statements are just statements rather than actual uh, uh, true missions of the university. Why it matters, um, because if we really are committed to diversity and inclusion, we need to consider social class, right? We, by disregarding social class in our conversations regarding diversity and inclusion, um, we're doing a disservice to our students, but also to, to our faculty that find themselves in this, this culture that is largely middle class. Um, so I, I guess what I'm getting at, and it kind of it seems a little bit redundant, but if we don't look at this data, if we don't compile this data, if we don't know this information, we can't really develop policies and practices that can be truly inclusive um, of our student body and also our, our faculty. Um, most of the discourse in the United States that, that looks at diversity uh, glosses over social class again, right? That, that notion uh, measures or conceptualizations of diversity include uh, race and ethnicity, sex and gender and increasingly gender identity. Um, and although these, these are very important, I don't mean to dismiss these at, to any extent, um, but by privileging those, um, we're, we're also neglecting the social class differences, even though these obviously overlap, there's a relationship between race and ethnicity and social class. So I think that we need to reconceptualize uh, diversity and inclusion um, and, and you know, incorporate social class, because as we know, class uh, is a variable that is correlated with nearly every other uh, uh, social indicator that we as sociologists care about from health to wealth and whatnot. Um, so there's plenty of literature that suggests that the culture of higher education is not inclusive, right? The working class students and faculty lack a sense of belonging um, and that students and even faculty struggle uh, struggle in getting integrated and engaging in this uh, typically middle class or upper class culture. Um, we, if we look at survey data that the majority of faculty and students from working class backgrounds report feeling isolated and marginalized by their colleagues, by and for students, by by their advisors, by their instructors, by their, their administrators. Um, so. If we want to think about retaining students and helping them succeed and also retaining faculty and helping them succeed in higher education, we need to really uh, address and bring social class into the discourse and think about ways to make the, the university less classist. Um, if, uh, I'm just going to go over a little bit of research again. This is in um, the PowerPoint set that you can look at it later, but um, if we look at some uh, recent research that's done by uh, some scholars, sociologists, we find that working class students report a lower sense of belonging on campus, really no surprise. They find campuses are less welcoming to them and um, they feel uh, less involved. And there are some pragmatic ways in which we can incorporate these students, again, and faculty as well, into the university setting. Um, first and foremost, I think that we need to to, as I've suggested, collect better data. We need to really know the social class composition of our students and faculty. And we need to, again, uh, open up discussions about class on campus in our classrooms, particularly sociologists, um, but also other, other disciplines and fields need to think about, um, about how so social class is implicated in their discipline. And again, in reconceptualizing or, or thinking about our conceptualization of diversity inclusion, uh, social class needs to be a variable that's there as well as race and ethnicity, sex, gender. Um, like we discuss, discussed male privilege and white privilege, I think we should also be discussing class privilege in our classrooms. Um, just simple things that faculty seem to overlook and also administrators. Um, when looking at students' ability to register, typically in the United States, students can't register until their fin financial aid goes through. So they can be the last to to get into courses or uh, find them find themselves like closed out of classes because their financial aid hasn't gone through. So we need to think about how registration correlates to financial aid and allow um, 
equal access for students from working class background. Simple things like textbook costs, um, they affect our working class students disproportionately and our lower income students. So increasingly, my university and other institutions are going towards open education, education resources. Um, but simple things like putting a, a desk copy on reserve at the library make a huge difference in the lives of our working class students. Um, we also tend at my university, and I assume at others, and literature suggests this, that we tend to uh, to disrespect or delegitimize students' employment while they're in school. The idea is that they're students and only students, but working class students have other responsibilities, um, financial and, and other ways. They have responsibilities in their families and they often in times work outside of, of school. So we need to acknowledge and legitimize their, their other responsibilities. Um, there's research that suggests that working class students experience uh, anxiety about talking in class and talking to their instructors and talking to their advisors. So I think that we, we need to recognize that and find ways to, um, to make our students feel comfortable talking to us. Um, NPR recently had a story, National Public Radio had a story recently about how office hours are scary for working class and lower income students. So simple things like not just uh, telling your office hours the first day of school when you go over the syllabus, but also explaining what happens during office hours, explaining to our students what happen happens during advising, I think are ways in which we can make them feel more comfortable. And then the whole alphabet soup of higher education of acronyms like MCCAA, our students don't know what these terms mean um, because they're first generation and working class students. Um, they're not accustomed to, to this language and neither are their parents and, and friends. So I think that uh, just getting rid of the jargon to a large extent can help incorporate our students. Um, great work uh, uh, recently out um, looking at how, uh, how <laughs> middle class students assume a lot of time in the classroom, um, tend to feel like it's a secure place and that their, their uh, teachers are there for, for them and should allow them space in the classroom where working class students don't. So, um, teachers' evaluations of working class students differ based on, you know, how many students raise their hand and what kind of space they're taking up in the classroom. Um, again, th this research I'll, I'll leave on um, the PowerPoint so people can see, but extracurricular activities. Um, I know at my institution there's a push for internships and independent studies. Well, when our students are working full time um, outside of, of going to college full time, they really can't be integrated into um, these unpaid internships or extracurricular activities. And research has suggested that, that middle class students tend to get these opportunities, which helps create social networks and therefore, as you know, just recreates the class structure. Um, just a, a couple things I think that research suggests, research suggests that, that the single most important avenue for support for working class students is faculty members that come from similar backgrounds and again, identify as working class. So I think that as faculty, we need to come out and we need to own that identity um, so that our students can identify with us and um, feel secure in reaching out to us and we can be resources for them on campus. There's a growing literature that suggests that working class uh, faculty are, you know, they're documenting their experiences and they are indeed coming out. Um, language like um, class straddling and border crossing. Like, so we see that more and more working class faculty are identifying as such. And the American Sociological Association has just created recently a task force on first generation and working class people in sociology, which I think is a good step forward. Um, I can't, I'm gonna exit my screen so that I can see all you again, I hope. I, I don't know if I'm over on time. I hope I didn't go into anybody else's time, but. No, you're just on time. Okay. okay. Uh, I didn't say earlier, but if you've got any Q and A's um, questions, if you've got the, if um, the, delic the attendees want to put them in the Q and A box and we'll look through them at the end. But if there's anything that's super pressing, um, then we'll ask them just after the presentations. Um, there is, there's one question here um, that you've been asked. So it says, great paper on social class tracking. If universities are middle class domains, um, hence the resistance to openness, how do we break down the class barriers for the benefit of our disadvantaged students? Telling stories only goes so far. Our students listen, but senior management turns data and valuable missions into empty signifiers. Uh, it's a great question. <laughs> I wish I had had a good answer. Again, I think that, um, if, do you want me to answer now, Molly, or do you want me to wait till the end? 
Um, if you need more time, then you can think about answer it after. It's up to you. I think data matters, right? And and I think that I kind of belabored that point that I think that we need to recognize um, the degree to which working class people are in the academy, um, and first by acknowledging that and in ourselves when we do, you know, penetrate that class barrier and find our way experiencing social mobility um, in education that it, we hold a, a tremendous responsibility to our colleagues and to our to our students who come from similar backgrounds to question um, these, you know, lip service diversity statements like the one that I suggested earlier, but we, that it's, you know, we have a responsibility, I feel, and, and it puts a burden on us um, in a lot of ways, but I think that it, it, it's a burden that, um, that, that we share, and I, th I think that we can work together to kind of solve some of these systemic issues. I really loved your paper. I thought it was uh, it's so good and there's so much that I like resonate I was trying to make notes but I just wrote words single words everywhere <laughs> um, I, I spoke really quickly and I just wanted to keep it all in the time so I'll, I'll put those slides up and add some more um, after the questions I'll add some more comments onto my slides to share our second uh, speaker is Lee Crooks hang on let me spotlight yeah there he is um, Lee, so Lee is a uni teacher in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the University of Sheffield. Lee continues to suffer episodic feelings of imposter syndrome, but looks forward to a higher education sector where he can work alongside others who share his outlook. It's, it's, real, it's a real privilege to be here today. I've, I've not been able to attend all the sessions, but I've, I've really enjoyed those that I've been able to get to. And, and, and the one this morning was really fascinating. And, and a lot of the things that I've been hearing, some of the things yesterday as well, uh, really resonate with, with my experience uh, and a, a lot of, of common ground. Uh, and I think it, um, I, I'm going to be quite self-indulgent and, and talk about my story of getting into higher education. Um, and, uh, and as part of that, I'm an only child, but I, found, I feel like I found my brothers and sisters today, today and yesterday. And uh, it's it's been uh, really powerful. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. I've, I've got quite a lot to say. I've got my 15 minutes of fame here, so I'm going to try and pack quite a lot in. But I, I will be making my slides uh, available. I think I've had to think about it. What I've got to say is quite critical uh, of, of of the the university where I work. Um, it's a Russell Group University, and I think I'd, I'd say this of any Russell Group university potentially. It's just where I, where I found myself in, in working in my hometown, and I think that there's something about being a working class academic and, and being a working class academic in your hometown that, that, that makes um, the experience even harder, uh, greater and more challenging. So um, I'll try and share my screen, but um, I hope this goes to plan. Um, one of our own being a working class hometown academic, Molly's already introduced me. Um, what, what's in the name? Who's this person, Lee Crooks? Um, this does some work that was done in The Guardian. Um, a few years ago, uh, just uh, for a bit of a laugh, I think, uh, and it's it's sort of showing the the names of the uh, first names of, of FTSE 100 directors, prisoners, uh, and Guardian staff, uh, and you can see there that uh, Lee uh, is is one of the top 30 names for for prisoners back in 2013. So um, I, I could have ended up in prison, um, and also when you look at this as well, Oxford undergraduates. Uh, and footballers, uh, I'm, I'm hearing footballers as well, but unfortunately, uh, my footballing prowess uh, wasn't great. Uh, and with the name like Crooks as well, um, it, it's difficult um, to, to, to avoid uh, certain connotations. Uh, I've never researched my family history, um, but there is a suburb of Sheffield called Crooks, so I'm hoping um, that that's where my name comes from. Um, just to sort of be more self-indulgent even, um, I was born in 1970, I grew up in Sheffield very much, my, my sort of formative years were in the 1980s. Um, if you can see, I, I love maps because I work in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. I, I, grew, uh, I sort of grew up in this little uh, village outside Sheffield called Mosborough, uh, five miles from the centre of Sheffield, it's here, the university's here. Uh, my, my granddad worked at a mine here in the, near a place called Killamarsh. Uh, my dad grew up here. Uh, in a little mining village called Bayton um, and just here you can see a place called Orgreave uh, and this picture is, is one of the things that happened at Orgreave it, it was the, the main flashpoint during the 1984-5 miners strike and, and that you can see th there's just about sort of three miles between me and Orgreave and that when I was a 14 year old lad 
that that was the thing that had the, the biggest impact on my on my life really um, and, and in terms of the, the clash between the working class and the state and the police and and that that's where my, my politics um, sort of really started to, to take off Sheffield and South Yorkshire as well were, were, were controlled by left-wing um, councils and the left-wing South Yorkshire County Council uh, and that affected the, the, my understanding of the world as well and it was very much challenging Thatcherism, Thatcherism at the time. Uh, and the other part of, the, of this um, that, that's relevant, uh, my, my dad was a fireman uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but um, my mum was actually working at the University of Sheffield uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, she, she was a typist uh, and, and she worked in a department in, in, as one of the support staff. And, uh, and, and one, home she, one, one day she came home from, uh, from a day at work. And, uh, and this, this is what makes me quite sad and I apologize here. And, and the professors had, had sat down with her uh, and basically because they, they must have finished the mark and they've got nothing better to do. And, and for their fun, they, they asked her to read some work, words aloud, some long words, um, and, and basically made fun of her. <coughs> And, and, and that really impacted on me as, as a working class lad, and, and it has done ever since. So apologies. So th this, this was where I grew up. This was um, um, in Mosborough. And um, you can see there's a fire station there. That there are, there are 12, 12 houses. And that was because there were, there were two shifts, a night shift and a day shift. Um, and, and that varied. Um, and the firemen were day shift and night shifts alternately. Everyone's dad was a fireman uh, and is a fantastic uh, collective community. Uh, and what I really developed from, from being there was a sense of, of, of we being. Uh, and, and Chris Allen is someone I met during my PhD uh, and he talks about ethical dispositions towards people's lives with others. And, and, and that's what I gained from, from growing up in, in, in Mosborough uh, and with my dad as a fireman. Uh, my dad had started out as a painter and decorator became a fireman, he got one GC, GC in woodwork uh, and, and a brilliant guy and gave me a strong, really strong set of values as did my mum. So growing up in Sheffield, um, a city with a conscience but no ego, it's a working class city, it suffered mass unemployment in the 1980s uh, as a result of deindustrialization and Thatcherism and, and the legacy of this is evident in some really stark inequalities in health um, but, but for me, the, the really strong point of the city is a sense of fairness, of doing right by people, of self-deprecation and humility. Um, the, the, there's a, a, lo a local star called um, John Lewis, Cole Brothers as it's affectionately known in Sheffield, never knowingly undersold, but, but Sheffield is never knowingly oversold. And, and there's a, an economy of speech in Sheffield, you, you can't have long conversations in the steelworks, it's too loud and noisy. So we try and say things in very short, concise, terms and we can be a bit blunt in relation to that so it's difficult being an academic and, and taking um, pages and pages to say um, a couple of sentences uh, but there's a glorious sense of humour in the city as well a lot of hard graft and it gave me my accent and a really strong set of working class values um, and, I, and I often wonder if only the university could be more Sheffield uh, and I, I'll talk about that quite a bit um, one, our former Lord Mayor, uh, Majid Majid, uh, was a brilliant breath, uh, guy, uh, breath of fresh air a couple of years ago. He had his own version of, of Sheffield's Ten Commandments. Uh, I'll just give you a few seconds to, to read that. I hope everyone's still with me. Um, so, sorry for, for breaking down a little bit there, but it's, it's been an emotional and exhausting um, few weeks and, and a couple of days. So when I did get my t to my PhD in my 30s, um, I'd, I'd gone to Manchester to do politics uh, when I was in my 20s. I got, I got working in, in local authorities after that, um, but, but I, I felt that I needed to, to do something more. Um, my job wasn't really going anywhere uh, and um, I, I came to the idea of doing a PhD and it was a difficult decision. Um, we, we just had the, my daughter uh, and, and it was a big financial sacrifice. Um, and it was a challenging time, but I, I felt the need to, to do it and, and, and to, to try and demonstrate that I was capable of doing it. And this question of who and what the university is for came to me very early um, because my research was about um, housing regeneration projects in the north of England that involved the demolition of, of, of working class housing. And, and what I saw really troubled me because there were a lot of researchers and academics there who were basically developing research that would um, lead to the justification and legit legitimation of, of demolition and gentrification. 
uh, and and having come from a working class background and the values that I'd, I'd sort of grown up with it, it it seemed appalling to me that that university research was being in this way and from from then on I, I sort of really came to the idea of trying to challenge that um I, I sort of um, I think many of the wedding participation boxes for the university in terms of being mature uh, in terms of my parents class in terms of um, coming from a low participant of participation neighborhood and a state school uh, and it provided that sort of periodic affirmation of the lie of meritocracy the local lad done good and and I had this straight really strange sense of being an outsider in my hometown that, that the University of Sheffield feels different from the rest of the city and 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 for, for a lot of people um, who have not had uh, experience and engagement with higher education that it, it's off limits it feels off limits because it, it feels quite like a, an elitist place on the hill and, and it for me it created this uneasy feeling of, of in-betweenness not being quite good enough um, and in, in terms of doing my work and, and then becoming an academic at, at Sheffield um, there's a lot of pressure to work harder than others to try and feel useful as, as, as a working class person um, this, this has come through generations to try and demonstrate that you've been productive and useful um, and, 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 and that sort of weighs heavily on you as a working class academic and, and also at the same time demonstrating your worth to others as part of that. Uh, and what I found as well, this sense of we being that I'd grown up with on that, on that estate of 12 houses, that wasn't very apparent in the university. When I got talking to the porters, the catering staff and, 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 and the cleaners, it was. Um, people who were there for others, the sense of we being, but with a lot of the academics, it was very much about their own careers and, and, and their um, own sense of identity and self-importance. Uh, and I really missed that that sense of, of and, and, and collegiality is a some sort of substitute for that. And, and the, there are good, strong elements of that within my department and within the university, but it, it's not the same. Um, so I'm just a, one of a handful of Sheffield born academics in the Faculty of Social Science. Um, interestingly, um, there seem to be more in science and engineering, and I, and I don't, and I'd, I'd be interested in exploring why that is. Um, you can't really have a, a class interpretation of, of specific mathematical formulae, I suppose. So I think there's something there in that, that that's worth exploring. And then these hidden injuries of, of being a working class academic, the experience of everyday elitism, the feeling of not being clever enough or being insufficiently articulate, and the terror of peer review of not being literary and, and not being able to write. As, as well as my peers. Um, as, as well, uh, people outside the university said, oh, you don't sound like an academic, you sound just like me, which is to say so much in itself. Uh, and then some of the students' co comments um, that I've seen on module evaluations, I didn't think I'd be taught by someone local uh, and really quite dismissive. Um, and, 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 I, um, and I think someone mentioned this this morning, uh, Learning to Labour by Paul Willis uh, in the university. Um, I think it's talked about learning to labour for, for working class uh, young lads basically and, and how they ended up with, with um, low paid, low school jobs often um, and, and, and often they messed around at school because school wasn't of interest to them and it wasn't interesting enough for their interests and how they saw the world. Uh, and I think for me, um, that, that what does that look like in a university? How do you learn to labour as a working class individual in a university? And, and that's often meant me acting the clown. Um, trying to find humour in things, trying to puncture the formality of things, code switching and hybrid identity, all the things that other people have been talking about. And there's also a realisation from me that most of my colleagues could do their work pretty much anywhere. Um, Sheffield's just a stopping, stopping off point along their career paths. Um, they have elected belonging that, that Mike Savage has talked about. But for me, it, it, it means something very different. That's the view from my ivory tower. Um, it's, there's a big um, block of student flats in front of it now that are just in the process of being built. I hope I didn't leave my window open because there might be some nesting birds in there. I've not been back for, for some time since um, COVID-19 has taken off, but there it is. So what, what I come to here is, is who and what is the university for? And um, Sheffield's got an interesting history. There wasn't a university in Sheffield in 1903. Um, so the city fathers, in the terms of the big industrialists of the, of the city at, at the time, um, they and, and, and others put together a campaign to try and fund the university and they put flyers across all the workplaces in Sheffield, in the mines, in the steelworks, uh, and, and in shops, everywhere, to try and get ordinary people to support the idea of the university and, and to actually donate money, a penny, we call the penny scholars, to try and set this up. And the good people of Sheffield 
and South Yorkshire donated to that the pennies. They raised the equivalent of forty million pounds at the time. And number one on that list, um, if you see it, that flyer, the university will be for the people. So as someone who's grown up in Sheffield, this, this is really important to me. What does that mean? What did that mean? And what does it mean today? Uh, and this is a university building on, on campus at the moment. It's called the Information Commons. To actually access it, you have to be paying uh, student tuition fees. Um, and uh, there's no entry sign you'll see just outside it. So it's not actually that um, inclusive uh, and it's not a commons. So, Nate, you've just got yeah. a, a few more minutes. Okay, thanks. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll crack on. Like I said, I'll, I'll make these available. So what does a civic university look like in the 21st century? Why don't more, more local people ask questions of us, make demands of us? Uh, why can't we do world-class research and teaching on our doorstep? How do you create a university that's for the people in the early 21st century? So these are all things that, that I've been looking at uh, in my research and in my teaching. Um, I've seen precedents from elsewhere. This is Ira Harker, who's done work at UPenn uh, in the US um, in, in terms of trying to um, get the university working much more with the people on, on the doorstep and the communities there. So all sorts of precedents here in terms of this kind of work, particularly in the US, ideas of service learning and some examples from here and this development of, of anchor institutions, this idea, and I think uh, someone this morning referred to the uh, magnet institutions, which I think is a, is a better term, much better. So I've been involved in engaged learning projects at Sheffield, a mix of service learning, action research um, that's collaborative, reciprocal, it's not extractive, and it's got mutually beneficial outcomes for local partners and students. And I think as well, don't underestimate the impact that uh, we have on students through our teaching. We've got a responsibility to civilise middle class students and get them to care because they end up in a lot of professional jobs that involve working with working class people uh, and we need to try and develop their empathy and care. And Atley and Beveridge both went to a settlement house in East London, Toynbee House, and they got that experience of working with working class people and the welfare state came from that, as Atley attests there in, in that slide. So being local very quickly, um, I'll show up very soon, different relationship with the city, research and teaching, you feel compelled to do even more to make the university work for the city. It's the beast at our back with all these requests, papers, grants, and also this weight of the city on our shoulders. Um, strong commitment to reclaiming the civic role, commitment to making the university more Sheffield, and valuing the local. Um, it gives you a different form of cultural capital and an authenticity that's potentially a very dangerous thing when institutional politics come into view. And just my beloved Sheffield United, the local football team, they're doing the best that they have done in about 50 years, in the history really. And those two guys there, both working class Sheffield lads, the manager, Billy Sharp, the top goal scorer, um, and a real connection with the fans because of that. Um, and they're doing the, the best they've ever done. What if um, university leadership involved ordinary working class people who had a strong connection with their hometown and that could have a much stronger connection with people um, in the community and it would be our university rather than the university. So conclusion, be more Sheffield. University is often always about making people become more middle class because that's somehow seen as better. Well, fuck that. What would a working class university look like? It's value driven, it's of the people, by the people, for the people, locally focused, locally accountable, engaged, not aloof, caring, compassionate, inclusive, homely, neighbourly. And Lou Mycroft, brilliant yesterday, joyous, cool, filled with creativity, energy, accents and solidarity. We being rather than me being, it's unstoppable, it's irreverent, it's irrepressible, it's unconventional, just like this conference. It's life changing, a world changing thing of beauty. So as a start, I'm trying to develop a, a working class student staff association and getting external people into, to govern what we're doing, engage learning. Um, don't listen to those that say you can't, listen to the ones that say you can, but don't get impaled on those uh, spikes while you're doing it. Um, so that's, uh, I'll stop sharing. Sorry for taking up so much time. Lee, don't be sorry. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think I share everybody's sentiment when I say that those academics who spoke to your mum and treated your mum like that are a group of wankers. Um, but thank you so much for sharing and it's really brave of you. And I think you're the fifth person to make me cry today. <laughs> um, so thanks. But <laughs> thanks, Molly. Um, there thanks, are Lee. quite a few questions for you um, in the Q&A. And I'm... I didn't quite get the chance to look at them because I was listening to you. Um, but if you want to have a look while the others are speaking and then we'll come back to you at the end. But I can't, I can't thank you enough for sharing that and for telling us about your experience. Thanks, Mark. Uh, 
And now we move on to um, Chloe McLean. Um, so Chloe is a lecturer in sociology um, at the University of West Scotland. She's a first generation um, and student and she received her undergrad and PhD at Edinburgh. Um, and her work explores, um, no, and her experience at Edinburgh, I'm so sorry, uh, uh, in partially facilitated and inspired her interest in the embodiment of power relations. Um, Welcome, Chloe. Thanks very much for that, Molly. Um, I've loved all the presentations so far and throughout the whole conference. Um, my presentation, you know, there's lots of similarities to things that people have already said today and yesterday. Um, so I'm going to share a pre-recorded presentation. Um, I mean, many reasons, but I guess basically I was a wee bit nervous and, you know, I've realised now that I shouldn't have been at all because it's been such a a warm and inclusive environment here. Um, and like I say, I'll just press play. Um, I've made a wee mistake at the start and I cut out my name when I introduced myself, so don't worry about that. Okay. I'm a lecturer at the University of West Scotland and I'm delighted to be here at the Working Class Academics Conference. What a brilliant idea. Um, I've pre-recorded this partly because I'm in the next connection and partly because I'm about to go on annual leave and I've got so many things to tie up and I thought, do you know what, if I just pre-record this, this is one less um, worry just now. But I'm really looking forward to, you know, interacting live during the questions. That would be brilliant. So today I'm going to talk about my experiences as a working class person going to Edinburgh University, which is a Russell Group or elite university, and reflecting on how a working class imposter syndrome was created here. So work, imposter syndrome uh, was first coined by Clance and Immis. They first titled it as imposter phenomenon, um, which they identified in their study of high achieving women. So these were women that worked in academia or other such professions that were extremely intelligent um, and had much evidence of their intelligence but yet did not believe themselves to be clever. In fact, they were convinced that they'd fooled anybody um, and everybody around them into thinking that they were competent within their work setting. When of course the reality was that they were, you know, much clear they were certainly clever enough to be there despite them feeling like everybody else around them must be more clever than themselves imposter syndrome has been used quite a lot in sort of popular psychology now um, and it's coming into sort of popular discourse as well often presented in an individualistic way um, where it's seen as a problem that you might have that you can solve through doing x y or z however maddie breeze suggests that actually imposter syndrome is um, structurally created within higher education she suggests that imposter syndrome is, is an institutionally effective regime of fraudulence, inauthenticity and inadequacy. This is what creates the feelings of um, intellectual inadequacy in higher education. What I'm going to argue in this presentation is that working class imposter syndrome is also on top of that intellectual um, feeling of inadequacy. It's also a feeling of an inadequacy of character. And partly that is because higher education is framed as a tool for social mobility. That if you go to university and if you work hard, then you'll be able to move from working class to middle class or middle class to upper middle class, etc. It's a tool for upward mobility based on meritocracy of equal opportunities where those that try hardest win. Now, of course, lots of social scientists have had lots to say about social mobility, including Friedman and Lorison, whose book, The Class Ceiling, uh, has lots, lots of evidence in it to show that this idea of higher education as a meritocratic tool for social mobility is just not true. It doesn't work. So, very great book if you want to, you know, have some concrete evidence to prove that. Um, and also the term social mobility itself is problematic because the way that social mobility is um, used and talked about um, is one in which suggests not only that upward and downward mobility is possible, but it is suggestive that a desire for upward mobility should be, you know, universal amongst everybody. Everybody should want to move upwards. And that moral imperative of should move upwards also carries with it the suggestion that because, well, 
why do we need to move upwards? What, what is it that we're getting away from? What we're getting away from is being working class. That working class is a deficit that we should seek to move away from. The other concept that I want to talk about is cleft habitus. So Bordeaux suggests that a ha cleft habitus or habitus clive occurs when our embodied dispositions come into complete contradiction uh, or contrast with a new field that we're entering, such as higher education, where the embodied expectations and dispositions expected within that field are in complete contrast to those that we've developed through our habitus. Now, Ingram and Abraham suggest that at this point, there's four different sort of routes that people might go. They might abandon their habitus to adopt that of the new arena that they've entered, that of higher education. They might reconfirm their habitus through this process and reject the new uh, arena, reject higher education. They might reconcile, reconcile their habitus where they combine parts of the original habitus with this new um, the expectations of higher education, the dispositions that they expect there, and you have a sort of combination of the two merged together. Or you might have a destabilised habitus, and that is a habitus which is characterised by a feeling of conflict, panic, confusion, and not feeling like you belong anywhere, um, created from this sort of clash of um, habituses or habitus expectations which is probably where I feel myself most of the time. And so I'm going to argue through this that working class people are encouraged in higher education to abandon their habitus. So this is where I came from. This is the start of the story. I lived in Broomhouse until I was 27 when I got my first academic uh, post at a different uh, university in a different city. But done all my school and all my university living in this street here. Dreamhouse is a council estate within the city of Edinburgh. It's got a high percentage of council houses still there. Um, but other and you know this is where I developed my habitus. Some other important things to talk about at the start of my journey is that because I've you know done my education in Scotland and I would always choose to do my university at the same city I lived in because it'd be too costly not to. But within the Scottish system you have your attrition fees paid for by the Scottish Government for your undergraduate degree so I didn't have to pay any fees and if I did have to pay fees I wouldn't have went to university. If I was born in England I wouldn't have went to university. Um, also I got the Student Awards Agency Scotland payments. These were payments for students who came from low-income families or households. There were means tested that affected the amount of money that you could get, but it was up to roughly £2,000 a year that you didn't need to pay back. It was just there to help you pay for your living costs. And those two things enabled me to go to university, to come from here, Broomhouse, and go to here, to the Edinburgh University. Now, obviously, that experience going to Edinburgh University is, wow, what a culture shock. I mean, look at these buildings that Edinburgh University has, beautiful buildings. And I was so excited to go to these buildings because that idea that you could legitimately go in these, that these buildings were for you, was something that was very exciting. I mean, you couldn't even really go to Debenhams without having security guards following me around as a teenager, let alone go into buildings like this. And now this is somewhere where I was legitimately able to go. However, obviously, once I went in and met the people, I realised that that wasn't quite true. And I remember the culture shock of meeting the different people, uh, meeting middle and upper class people for the first time in my life. I remember the first tutorial I went to, everybody sitting down trying to make friends, chatting before class started about, you know, where did you do your gap year? Or what, um, you know, what sort of unpaid internships did you go on? what ski trips and all this kind of chat which was completely alien to me. I was looking around thinking, oh god, like, I don't know what they're talking about but also I really hope they don't ask me anything, which of course they didn't because they already knew that I wasn't someone that was worth asking anything to, I wasn't someone that was worth making friends with. I remember looking at them as well and thinking they all looked so polished and professional or even if they'd done a deliberately messy hair or slobby clothes, they still looked polished. And I was like, I don't know how they do that. 
um, and they talked in what seemed like riddles to me. They sounded much more clever and were using fancy words. And I just remember thinking at this moment, I've never met anybody like this in my life. How? So it was complete culture shock. Um, but one in which I very much felt, you know, this place, I, I stand out like a sore thumb here. I don't really belong here. But alongside this, it wasn't just feelings of like being overwhelmed or shocked. It was also getting, you know, working class culture attacked as well. So I remember overhearing students talking about the post-92 uni, which was just along the road from where I grew up. Um, and you know them talking so badly about this uni, really putting it down, making it out as if it was for idiots, but also saying, oh yes, and imagine when you come out there, you need to walk amongst the zombies of Sight Hill. Which is obviously, you know, I'm the zombie, like, I live just beside Sight Hill. <laughs> so there was these attacks on working class culture that people would happily make within this institution. And it wasn't just student staff done it too. I remember being in a master's ethnography class and we were to conduct a small ethnography and the lecturer was talking about those possibilities and he said, Oh, but you know, you can't do anything though. Um, so for example, you might want to research the peoples of Wester Hales, but that would be too dangerous. And again, Wester Hales was a council estate that's just up the road from where I grew up. It was one where I spent most of my summers as a teenager hanging around. I had friends in that area that I mucked about with. And I just felt so angry when the lecturer said this. I felt like I could punch him. And obviously I would never have done that. But for him to say that, it suggested two things. It suggested one, that they don't know anything about working class people, that's for one, and that they certainly shouldn't be researching them. But also two, that they didn't expect working class people to be in the same setting as them. And so these experiences marked me as sort of feeling out of place, marked me as dangerous, tasteless or disgusting for having a working class background. This is a picture of a Jack Wills catalogue. Um, Jack Wills is a clothing brand that's aimed at university students but really white middle class um, and upper class students and the look that they're giving us just now that's you know this is what people at my uni looked at and I think this is how they looked at me as well. Um, but to my shame I bought a Jack Wills hoodie um, because that feeling of you know, being attacked by my culture and stuff. I just wanted to fit in by that point. I just wanted to get by, really. It wasn't even fitting in, it was just getting by. Um, so I bought a Jack Wills jumper, but obviously it didn't look right on me. You know, it didn't, I didn't look like they looked like when they wore it. And it's that thing about an embodied class, that actually, even if you want to assimilate to the middle class and upper classes, you still let your working class dispositions shine through. Um, so I would hide my accent, I would change it a bit and I would never wear sports clothes despite being an athlete to try and you know, hide or not get taken as a working class person. Um, but there's also economic barriers as well. Of course, like there's this idea that living in a flat, that's like a coming of age sort of central part of being at university. But of course, that's not a part which I was going to be able to do at all. Um, or all the economic costs of keeping up with the clothing um, and nights out and all that that come with it. So there's economic and embodied barriers to trying to assimilate. And by the time I started my PhD, I was really not interested in assimilating at all. I was actually very resistant to it. I had no inclination, no desire whatsoever of being middle or upper class. I don't think I ever did, I just wanted to get by to be fair, but I was like, Do you know what, nah, now I feel like you're attacking me and I don't like this. I don't like being forced to not be um, myself in this setting, which is what I felt at that time and still possibly do. So I started to find value in working class culture despite all the messages I was getting at the university and part of that was recognising my working class dispositions as an asset so that of being able to be an independent sort of person which you know working class people we often work with our parents or carers or maybe we didn't have any so we've had to be independent as we've been growing up that thing about organisation just needing to be a bit more organised um, 
I think for a sociologist, being able, having that first-hand experience of understanding um, power relations and the impact that that can have and how these inequalities are recreated, we've had a first-hand experience of that. I disengaged with university spaces, that was part of my resistance and this picture here is my desk at my dad's that I'd done all my uni work from, um, including my whole PhD, it was all done at that desk there. I wouldn't go into uni spaces, I didn't feel like I fitted in and by that point I was like, Do you know what, I'm not putting myself through the pain that it causes me to go into those spaces and the shame that I feel because it's the people there that are wrong, no me. Um, I brought back my voice, I started talking my accent again, I thought, you know what, yes I will. I started wearing whatever I wanted to wear, whether that be trackies or whatever. Um, and when I was doing my PhD, I'd started teaching tutorials and stuff and, you know, I really loved being a working class person in that environment to try and help other working class students not go through the same what I went through, to try and be a sign that you know you are a hundred percent as good as anybody else in this room um, and yeah that was one of my sort of key key things which I still do now working at post 92 universities has kind of been a decision but also you know I guess like not to say I would get employed at elite uni because I probably wouldn't but um, I like working at a post 92 uni because most of my students in the unis that I've worked at from working class backgrounds and I think, do you know what, they deserve the best and they deserve to be respected. So again, this sort of comes into my teaching as to how do we resist this and how do we rise with our class. So through this I've suggested that working class imposter syndrome in Russell Group Unis is a feeling of inadequacy of character whereby to survive academia we're encouraged to leave our class. To reject our assimilation to upper class or middle class values we need to resist the idea or that enables us to resist the idea of working class people in working class culture as in deficit. But my main question really for everybody here is well what are our tactics for rising with our class? Um, I'm so you know I'm so interested in other people's perspective on how we do rise with our class and reject the idea of moving into the middle classes. And just lastly then, this is just a wee slide of references in purple at the bottom. If you do want to see the written version of this presentation, then that's the details there where you can go and find it. So just to say thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the questions. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for that. That was brilliant. And you can see from like the comments that people are leaving that you, what you said is so relatable. Um, and, and very emotional and very hard hitting. Um, although I did laugh when someone commented that you should have put a trigger warning when you put up the Jack Wills um, advert. <laughs> um, but I just before we go on to Teresa, I just wanted to ask how it felt when you first started to resist, when you first started to embrace who you were. Did that feel vulnerable at first? Yeah, and I think, you know, it didn't happen until I was in my fourth year of uni and to my, sorry, my PhD because, and there's a woman, Orla Murray, who has written about higher education as well, and she says, you know, acts of resistance in higher education, it's easier to do once you're in a legitimised position. So my PhD was funded, um, I wouldn't have done a PhD if it wasn't, um, and so, I, you know, I could sort of, jump on the back of the fact that that was funded to try and convince myself that I deserved to be there and that made resisting a bit easier and um, but yeah it wasn't until until then. Brilliant thank you so much for sharing we'll go through the Q&A and I'll let you look through the comments because everybody is just loving what you have to say um, and we'll go to our next speaker who is Teresa Crew. Teresa is a senior lecturer in social policy at Bangor University. She's not your typical academic, but she has just finished writing her book on working class academics, written because she wants her students to know that not every academic is posh. Um, Teresa's sent me her video to share with you all, but I just want to see if Teresa's got anything that she'd like to say before I press play. I think the only thing is trying to fit everything in in 15 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free. 
Hi, uh, my name is Theresa Crewe and I'm really proud to be part of this conference, uh, mainly because not enough people speak about class because, well, as we're told, we're all middle class these days. So um, it's been fantastic listening to a lot of the presentations and I'd like to continue on in that vein to talk about social class. So this, um, my presentation is based on a research project that I did um, based, that talks about working class academic capital. So if it's not immediately apparent, I am a working class academic. And that was really brought home to me um, when I've talked to students, because they would often say things like this, that we talk about, you know, that I was normal or approachable. Um, and at first I thought that these comments were situated in gender. I thought they were related to me being female. But the more and more I thought about it, and when I spoke to some other academic colleagues, um, namely male working class colleagues, I realised it, it's much more than that. It wasn't just about the fact that I was female. A lot of it was based on that I still live in the same um, housing estate. Um, I, um, well, I, I talk in very, very similar ways to many of my students. They just felt comfortable with me. And I think it's because it, I often remind them of the background, where, where, where they come from, where they live. So I decided to do this research project where um, I interviewed, uh, I've put here it's 87 self-defined working class academics. We won't get into the issue about, you know, how do you define somebody who's working class uh, academic? I can discuss that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but I interviewed uh, 87 people. It's actually over 87 people, but that's what I've recorded for now. Recruited people via Twitter, um, academic conferences. I should note that when I say academic conferences, I actually mean more social science type conferences. So obviously this means that my, um, my sample of these 87 academics tend to be, it's about two thirds are from the arts and humanities, one third from STEM subjects. Uh, also, uh, Twitter was very, very good to actually recruit people, by the way. I've also utilised these different theories as well by Pierre Bourdieu, so Pierre Bourdieu who talks about um, at times the, the capital that working class people lack in middle class spaces. Uh, Yoso Toro Yoso, um, who first used her theories to look at um, BME groups and the capital that they have, I utilised her theory to talk about, well, no, actually, working class people ha do have a huge amount of capital in middle class spaces. And then Crenshaw as well, I utilised her to talk about intersectionality because, you know, there are different intersections of the working class um, personality. So one of the areas that I looked at was what are the positive aspects of being a working class academic? And, you know, I could, there, there is, uh, in the book that I'm writing, unfortunately, there is two, at least two chapters that talk about the negative aspects. But for this presentation, I thought I'd focus on what are the positive aspects. So most people I spoke to, just going back to that picture a moment ago, talked about student support over and over again. I think it might have been at least three quarters, possibly about 80% of my respondents talked about that the student support that they provided. And this quotation here by one of my respondents explains why we are so uh, you know, talented, so good at providing student support. One of the reasons being is that you know, often we are used to, we, we understand the sacrifices that our students have had to make, our working class students, uh, students from uh, difficult backgrounds have had to make to actually enter university. You know, for, for instance, they may have caring responsibilities, little, you know, money, little, little economic capital, and also, uh, you know, talking about a life that doesn't kind of gel with the university experience. And I'm sure you know that the way that the university experience is talked about today, it's really focused around the middle class student who can move away from home, the first time away from home, that sort of thing. So in terms of student um, support, one way that working class academics um, supported students was actually helping them into higher education. And these are just two methods that were used. So just by the pure fact of being a working class academic can actually make you a role model. So for instance, um, Jane, a researcher in biological sciences, talked about just by having somebody from her background would have encouraged her to actually uh, consider a career in the sciences. And a lot of my respondents talked about how they would you know, visit um, uh, underperforming schools. They would actually make sure that they were there at open days 
to make sure that they represented, you know, not just students, the typical students that we saw, but the working class students, the students that are from similar backgrounds. Um, also, my respondents talked about, so for instance, Lynn here um, mentioned that she ran a monthly drop-in uh, session at a local community centre. And this would talk about, um, she would help students choose courses, she would just like, talk about what it's like to be in university in general, help them write personal statements as well. All these sorts of hidden knowledge that you don't have if you don't have a family background who's actually familiar with university. So that was another way that, as I say, many respondents talked about supporting students. They also talked about how they supported students through higher education. So the two key methods, again, role models was important. But in this way, what my respondents would do is they did not just see themselves as role models, that they would bring role models back in from the community into university. So for instance, they would ensure that their speakers were diverse, not just to have the usual you know, success stories, they would make sure that their speakers were diverse. Um, and also make sure that their reading lists were diverse, you know, would have, you know, more, um, not just the typical person on the reading list, but to ensure that we saw and heard from re uh, working class writers. That was so important to my respondents. Another thing is in my respondents talked about making sure that they were as welcoming as possible to those students who might not traditionally fit in. And this is where a working class academic can really come into their own. Just by being there as perhaps that role model, you can make, it sh make other students feel that they deserved and should be there as well. And I have many quotations that talk about that. This one in particular, um, Eileen talked about how once a term she meets up with students and doesn't just chat about academic work but also talks about other different areas of interest. One of the things that I noticed was my respondents would often use much more personal approaches with students and these students would really appreciate this that the lecturer would talk to them on a much more personal level much more down-to-earth level and that's what particularly helped in terms of um, you know developing you know support for students in that way that's why they were so good at student support another issue um, that I found when I analyzed the data was it wasn't just about student support as in you know being there if the student needs to talk to somebody you know being a representative it was also about the teaching approach so when I first started looking at the, the findings I would notice things here and there and as the, um, the analysis went on and as the interviews went on I started picking up what I term as a working class academic pedagogy and I still struggle to say that word now. Um, so it's a teaching approach, this is how I've defined it, it's a teaching approach that has social justice at its heart, which I'll discuss as we go on. It's also, it's, it comes from um, a student's uh, a strength-based perspective, so seeing your students as actually bringing something to academia, they're not there just to be empty vessels to, you know, bank information in, which is what Frere would say. And also, it encouraged students to see themselves as co-creators of knowledge. And my, my academics would talk about how they would also embrace shared experiences, which I'll explain a little bit. So in terms of embracing shared experiences, there's two examples here from my respondents. So Jamie, a lecturer in, in history, and Theo, a politics research fellow, talked about how they utilised their own experiences. So Jamie, as having family members who were involved in the Battle of Orgreave, and then Theo, a politics research fellow who uh, actually had family members on the Empire Windrush. They utilised both of these experiences in their teaching. But it wasn't just about these respondents using their own lived experience. Many of the students also were, you know, were past, had actually had family members involved in the Battle of Orgreave. They also had family members um, actually who were on Empire Windrush. So this is a nice way of actually teaching about, you know, different issues, historical um, fact, um, by actually utilising not just the lecturer's experience, but a shared experience. And students really did appreciate that. And one of the reasons why they did, this is a comment that I got, is that um, the respondent talked about how old style, so the typical academic from like an elite background, they felt made theory sound dry. So they gave the example this respondent does of, for instance, talking about poverty. And if you're going to talk about poverty and not sound angered or frustrated 
or upset, that is off-putting for students because our students actually think that, you know, lecturers are there to be good people standing up for individuals. And often the students would talk to this respondent about how lecturers just don't sound like that. They sound too removed from it. And what was so good, um, I kept on hearing over and over about working class academics, is they do sound angry and pissed off about some of the, you know, the inequalities that there are in society. So that was one of the issues. Then also they engaged with students from a strengths perspective. So what I mean by this, now Zipping talks about dark or hidden funds. It's supposed to say funds of knowledge, my apologies. But this idea of students having funds of knowledge, it's not just about you know, the, the happy funds of knowledge, but it's also these dark or hidden funds of knowledge. So experience of domestic violence, mental illness, drug addiction. Of course, this is not, you know, these dark funds of knowledge are not something that only uh, working class um, academics or working class students would have. But what I found is the working class academics, again, we're talking about three quarters of my respondents would mention using, um, you know, utilizing the strengths of students in their teaching. So, for instance, Lucy talked about how um, she said her students had produced some wonderful piece of writing that touched upon the personal experience of poverty, poverty and mental health. So rather than just teach about mental health, the issue was that she actually talked about mental health in relation to poverty and also related it to her own circumstances. And students felt comfortable enough to do that themselves. So, again, I, I mentioned right at the start about students being co-creators of knowledge. And uh, Unity here, I, I really liked the quote that Unity had. She said, we know our subject areas, but co-creating with students shows respect for their knowledge. And that is something that university as a whole hasn't always had, respect for the knowledge of working class students. If you think about the literature, if you read any of the literature on working class students, you will hear over and over about the lack of study skills, basically the lack thereof. And what was so, um, it was so heartening to see that the academics I spoke to really did respect the skills that, uh, and the knowledge that their own students had. So respondents talked about having students involved in course redesign, uh, choosing between different assessment methods. The students weren't just passengers on their degree, they were involved in their degree throughout. And I really did find it really heartening because this wasn't just one or two respondents who talked this way. This was at least three quarters of my respondents who talked about seeing students as being co-creators of knowledge. So in terms of as well, embedding social justice was all the way through and examples of that. So the idea was that um, they wanted the courses to be representative of, uh, you know, not just national working class people, but local working class people. And the way that they did that was just including in their assessments as the opportunity to raise money for organisations, social media campaigns actually being an assessment, and also connecting their assignments with the aim of social change. So it wasn't just talking about social change and describing what that was, but my students actually were the social change. And this was, so the students were the social change by virtue of the respondents that I spoke to. This was really heartening to see um, working class um, knowledge uh, being used to actually, yeah, working class students and working class academics working together to push knowledge, not just from the dry halls of academia, but actually to make an impact in society. So I'm going to end this uh, presentation with just to say, how can we move forward? Well, I have a couple of suggestions. Firstly, it's, it's pretty obvious we need to recognise class inequalities. I could pr produce a much longer presentation talking about the class inequalities that I found amongst the people that I spoke to for this research study. We have to recognise them. Also, we've got to challenge stereotypes. So again, this idea that when we see somebody who is a working class person working in academia, some people would suggest that I'm not a working class person due to my job. But it's these lazy stereotypes that mean because I've now got some form of a traditional education that I've moved out of the working classes. Well, that isn't true. And I won't have anybody impose on me what my identity is. Also, we've got to show solidarity to people, not just for working class people, but others on the margins of academia. We know how uh, few and far between there are lecturers from, you know, with disabilities, uh, lecturers, um, you know, we only need to look at statistics of black female professors to see, you know, they are woefully underrepresented. So we should be there to support them as well. 
reach out to people like yourself, which is why I wanted to do this research study. But also, finally, just to end, remember that you bring your own capital into higher education. You know, the things that you actually bring into academia, for me, beat somebody from a traditional um, academic background, hands down. If you're a student that I'm speaking to, you bring your own funds of knowledge. So please, I would suggest, don't forget the knowledge that you bring into academia. You're not there just to be spoken at. You can also contribute. Okay. Thank you so much, Teresa. Oh my God, I nearly screamed at my laptop when you said don't impose your stereotypes or your restrictions on me. I was, that was brilliant. Um, I haven't obviously been able to look at the Q&As or the chat, but um, do you have anything that you'd like to reflect on before we move on to questions? Um, just to say, what I would have liked to have talked about is um, the work of Tara Yosso. So if anybody wants to know more about how um, working class academics or any um, groups of people who are supposedly in deficit, um, look at the work of Tara Yosso. She has, she has been mentioned twice and that's something that you know, I would have talked about in the presentation. So um, yeah, I'd definitely say give the work of Tara Yosso a look. She's absolutely fantastic. She really is. She changed my book from being negative to positive. So yeah, brilliant. And I know you you're too humble to plug your book, but when is it out? Is it next year? Oh, um, I, I don't know if it's too humble. I think it's just because I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Um, so I'm literally submitting it tonight. Um, and then if I've more than like got 45 typos in it, I've no idea when it'll be out. But it's supposed to be out this year. It's supposed to be uh, as long as I don't put loads of typos. Hopefully. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for all the reference for Yosso as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, even though you've got a deadline today. We, oh, it's okay. It's been lovely. It's been fantastic. It's been absolutely fantastic. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions and I can see that um, Jackie and Lee have been answering a few already. Um, But I, I thought there was a lot of like connections between you all, especially with um, when Jackie's talking about how we've got to change the way that we view diversity statistics. Um, and then when Lee talks about feeling like a widening participation, like he fits nicely into those statistics as well. Um, I just, I found that really um, interesting and really uh, in, an important thing to talk about because so often we do just figure it feel like numbers and that's a big part of the imposter syndrome so I just didn't know if you two wanted to reflect some more on those things. I'm just kind of like thinking I didn't really uh, think until Molly mentioned about our connections I was really thinking about how Teresa ended and how I started um, and somebody's comment about coming out as working class in academia both as a student and faculty I, I realized that um, there are challenges to coming out, like I just briefly mentioned in my presentation, that we're ridiculed, stereotyped, and what, what not. Um, but even though it is difficult, I think it's tremendously important to identify as working class um, in academia, um, especially once you've achieved you know, a PhD, and so you can not only be a role model, but um, challenge the notion that, that this isn't an institution that we can perform in. Um, so, that's really all. I don't know. That doesn't really get to what Molly, Molly was talking about with uh, how you and I connect, Lee, but that's what I was just thinking after Teresa's presentation. Yeah, and, and, and this, this widening participation, it, it goes further as well because, um, well, well for, for me, it, it means, uh, in my experience, it means that I've, I've got this really strong ethos of care towards students that come in who are first generation students and have been to university. Um, and also, I, I, I get wheeled out there I say at, at, at various um, uh, events um, sort of um, open days at the university um, and where I, I'm sort of showcased as an example of the meritocracy that look at Lee he's, he's a local lad who's done well um, you can replicate that and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm used basically in a, in a lot of widening participation settings to, to do that. Uh, and and it, it feels quite exploitative um, and, 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 and I'm, I'm happy to do it to some extent but it, 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 it just becomes a little great and, and I'd love to see more changing beyond in, because I'm, I'm like one of a handful of people in my, in my home city 
from the home city working in the university and and and, and, it, and it, it really I, I really struggle with it because whenever I've been in other workplaces uh, surrounded by people from my culture and, and it, it's such a different experience it's, it's a lovely warm rich experience uh, but but it, it's really cold <laughs> I can't just put it in in clearer terms so, so, sometimes it, it's just this really cold feeling feeling of being alienated and not feeling part of it um, and, but I've, I've said enough already and, I, and I'm sorry I said too much earlier you didn't say too much. I, I would argue that 90 minutes is not enough for these kinds of discussions that we needed at least like two hours. <laughs> um, I found, uh, Clary, what was the question again that you, uh, you asked everybody? I think it was something um, about how do we rise of our class, was that? Yeah, yeah. So it was a um, quote by the socialist educator, John McLean. Um, he said, um, don't rise out of your class, rise with your class. So that idea of rejecting the idea of individualistic social mobility, um, moving upward into the middle classes, no well done you, working class person done well and now is no longer. Um, it's the how do we rise with our class? How do we stay true to our roots um, and reject all the shame which the middle classes want us to start to embody or want us to start to think about the working classes as they want st us to start thinking about the working class the way they think about the working class so they want us to kind of like become what they are and I guess it's that thing about you know we're in a we're now all in institutions which are predominantly middle class and but yet again there's lots of working class people that come into them and it's like right how can we do the best for these people that are coming in um, and rise everyone up rather than individualistically rise them up if that makes sense. Thank you so much. I I really enjoyed uh, all of your presentations, and I, uh, yeah, I uh, I don't know how to end it, so I'm just gonna air hug like a awkward person, and <laughs> hope that Peter takes over soon, so I can stop talking. I, I will. I'll take over. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank Chloe. you, Molly. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Lee. Thanks. Thanks, Teresa. That was brilliant. Just before you go, though, Lee, before you're off, I've got this for you. Wait one second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought I might get you singing along there you might not be able to resist but you <laughs> thank you and thanks everyone thanks for all the comments really appreciate it thank you